Welcome to the Say Network podcast. My name is Jim Sparks. I have Megan Vialpondo. Hey, guys. Abraham Guevara. Hello. Did I say those correctly? Perfect. Damn it. <laughs> and finally, finally, after years and years of asking, we've got <laughs> Kristen <laughs> Davis. Uh, Kristen is the, the editor-in-chief and yes. literary secretary for the very fancy USA Western Territory. Technically, Kristen theme now, but Davis is Did true I just to my call heart. You Kristen so, Davis? Yep. I have to concentrate to call her <laughs> Megan Vial Pondo. <laughs> and actually, in my phone, it still says Megan McQuaid uh, in there. And uh, and Kristen is a kind of new mom. Yeah. Woo. Two years into it, which is really exciting, and uh, also has um, a blog. On the outside. That's true. We'll yes. Wow. That. You did some research. I'll talk about that a little bit later, maybe. <laughs> and uh, but you have two major publications that you look after. Uh, yep. And so, can you just briefly share with uh, what those are? Sure. So, New Frontier Publications covers New Frontier Chronicle, which is a monthly newspaper that really focuses on news of the Salvation Army. It's really meant for people within the Salvation Army to find out what's happening across the Western Territory specifically, um, but also outside of our territory, just to get a broader sense of the organization and all we're doing and maybe some ideas on things you could do that are going on that are cool and could be replicated elsewhere. Um, and just to kind of keep up with people um, that are all over uh, geographically to kind of see what's happening. So that's New Frontier Chronicle. And then Caring is our magazine, which not long ago went to an all-digital format. Uh, that one is more geared for an external audience, people who are loosely connected to the Salvation Army. Maybe they've volunteered at a program or they've donated in some way, um, but might not have as much of the internal knowledge. That one is really our tool to try to help engage them further, to give them some more information about all of the various things that we do and that we offer and get them to come on board a little bit more. Awesome. Oh. Uh, both very fine oh, thank you. pieces thank of you. Uh, work. And, uh, um, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more a little bit later. But first, Megan is going to bring on some youth culture stuff for us. Yeah. So I was trying to think about what to talk about. And um, I thought I would talk about something that is pretty relevant to my life right now. Um, back in January, I decided to challenge myself to start to learn Spanish. <laughs> I understand a fair bit, but um, I wanted to actually formally learn Spanish. So I downloaded an app called Duolingo. You might have heard of it. And um, there's a ton of languages on there. Um, there's everything from real languages like Spanish to fictitious languages like High Valerian <laughs> from Game of Thrones. Really? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> I'm oh, serious. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's actually been really helpful just to learn. Um, I actually live in a city that is majority Spanish speaking people. Um, my apartment complex is majority Spanish speaking people. Um, my husband's family is from Mexico and primarily speaks Spanish in the house. And so I really wanted to find a way to try to, um, just connect with them further. And so I decided to um, basically download the app and, and go through and learn Spanish. It's actually helped me quite a bit. Um, speaking is still a little weak, but um, understanding and, and reading it, I'm, I'm getting a lot better at it. And so I just thought it'd be kind of a helpful resource for anybody who might have um, kids or families where like language is a barrier, you know, um, yeah. in, in your core or something like that. Um, it's a, I think it's a really cool way just to kind of like just start to try to learn, try to try to um, form form a connection uh, and take down a, a barrier to getting to know families. And How stuff. does the app do that? Like, what is it? There's like a combination of speaking. So sometimes it'll it'll give you a phrase and you have to speak it into the microphone and then it'll huh. it'll like kind of you evaluate you. That's yeah. Cool. It's like stars yeah. you know, like, for your pronunciation. Yeah. It's a lot of writing. I five stars on my voice review. <laughs> Can we get that on, like, for English to see how we do speaking? Oh, I know, right? I think English is actually on the app, really? too. Yeah, if you want to learn English. <laughs> One yeah. star. That's really cool. <laughs> um, it's something I recommend to how Service Corps. How much does it cost? Corps. It's free. That's the cool part. Oh. So I recommend it to Service Corps to prepare as they get ready to go out to their locations for the summer just to learn a couple of simple phrases, basic conversational um, phrases in their language that they're going into. Huh. 
any language that you want to learn, what is it? Um, I tried the other day to learn an Arabic phrase because mm -hmm. I the guys who cut my hair, mm -hmm. they're like the best, and uh, I've been wanting to say to ask for a haircut in Arabic, and a, and a guy that I know he tried to show it to me, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very tough. Well, I have an app for you to use. So yeah, I think I'm gonna try this app out. <laughs> called Duolingo. Yeah, I, I heard about it recently. Just so I can ask for a haircut, I have some friends, some Korean friends as well that I, I've been wanting to like learn a couple phrases because they speak. A, a friend of mine, he's Korean, and uh, he has a pharmacy in Compton, and he speak when he speaks Spanish, he sounds like like no accent. It's like really good. So that challenged me. I'm like, man, I wish I could like learn Korean to kind of show him up, you yeah. know. But uh, it's also very difficult. So I'm gonna try that app out. Kristen? Uh, well, Japan is pretty high on my travel mm. wish list right now, Stealing so I think that idea. I should uh, <laughs> learn some Japanese phrases. For... I really want to learn Japanese. Oh, there you yeah. go. We should learn together. I got konnichiwa. <laughs> yeah. I got that part down. <laughs> Doesn't that just sound That's fun? It just sounds It good. does. Yeah. That's why I want to learn it. It, 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 it. Their language sounds fun. It sounds hard, but fun. Megan, you got Oh, man. Well, Spanish one. Um, Game of Thrones. <laughs> no. I, if I'm going to nerd out, I'm learning Elvish oh, from man. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. No, I'm serious. <laughs> dead serious. I want to learn a Hebrew so I can talk to Dave. Oh, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be You strong. know what? Hebrew would be pretty cool. Well, cool. just start speaking Hebrew to Dave, and he'll rate you. Yeah, like the app. No, it's like a live that. app. It's we a have live a good app. relationship. I don't know if I yeah. could handle that. So, all right, cool. Uh, great resource, and the uh, link will be in the show notes. Um, but so, Kristen. Yes, sir. Uh, I've known you a long time, and That's true. when you were growing up, all you wanted to do was be a teacher. That is true. Because your mom is a teacher, a yep. very nice teacher. Mm -hmm. Now your sister's a teacher. Yep. But something changed. You ch changed correct because I think you changed your major. Is mm -hmm. that right? That's true. So what happened? So, yeah, my whole life I wanted to be a teacher, third grade specifically. Uh, you know, I figured that was like the perfect age. They're still cute, but they're not too little that they need a lot of help with everything and they haven't gotten a little bit older where they're annoying. So I thought that was like right in the sweet spot. As a of... parent of two that went through that age, <laughs> you're kind of right on. Oh, good. Yeah. See? Well, so that was always my goal. Third grade, uh, went to college and declared liberal studies and was on my path to becoming a teacher. And then it was sort of a perfect storm of one a really miserable earth science class that was horrible <laughs> and <laughs> I had a, a lot of other classes ahead of me that looked equally tragic and terrible uh sorry to anyone who really enjoys rocks I just can't do it <laughs> don't worry no rock lovers listen to this <laughs> perfect uh so that and then around the same time I was volunteering in a classroom <laughs> and I'll never forget this little boy that said, what are those red dots on your face? And I was like, that's it. I can't, I'm not, <laughs> no, nope. that was can't it. be a teacher. <laughs> Too honest, can't do it. So uh, I ended up in a, I needed an elective and randomly took an intro to journalism class mm. and just loved it, loved everything about it and ended up changing my major. I had to change schools because at the time my school didn't have a journalism program. Uh, and so I went for it and changed up everything, mm. hard right. And then you interned here, right? That's true. Yep. I uh, started as an intern while I was in college. I had to have an internship. And through some connections, Bob Doctor, thank you, <laughs> ended up interning here with the Salvation Army and have stayed ever since. And how long have you been here? Uh, 13 years, 13 or 14, right in there. Nice work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So why, <laughs> why are stories, I mean, your department is just collecting stories and writing stories and, and all that stuff. Why is it so important to the Salvation Army? Uh, well, I think it's real critical for the Salvation Army, but I actually would say that story is important to anybody, no matter right. where you're coming from. Um, stories help us understand ideas and help us connect to each other. Um, it's a way for us to, to just better understand who we're talking to, what we're trying to do, uh, better communicate what we want to do. Um, there's actually a whole field of study around this called narrative transportation theory that 
basically says when we are shown kindness uh, or we are trusted, we release a neurological compound called oxytocin. I'm sure you've heard of this. Um, that makes us more motivated to cooperate and to work with others. It enhances our sense of empathy. And you can actually hack that system, according to this research, through character-driven stories. So by telling stories that um, involve a person, that we uh, draw somebody into the story, into the tension that's happening within the story, we can basically latch onto their emotions and motivate their involvement and their further engagement in whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. So mm. it's a powerful tool for anybody, um, but obviously that definitely applies to Salvation Army as well. That's why when we watch a James Bond movie, you feel like you could come out and conquer the world mm. or why we're devastated watching Old Yeller. Um, it's that narrative transportation theory dead that's dog. capturing <laughs> our emotions. I know, any dead dogs. Not good. <laughs> Spoiler. Sorry. Oh, jeez. Oh, I thought he went to Puppy Lake. Oh, it's possible. Um, Kristen, I'm curious, is there a particular story that you've worked on that has just had a really um, great impact on you personally? Yeah. I. It's funny. In the last uh, year or so, um, since becoming a mom, actually, one of the very first stories that I worked on on my own has just been on my mind a lot lately, and I, I don't know why, really, but it's been so long now. Um, but one of my first reporting outings as an intern, totally on my own, um, which I remember was a big deal. And also, if you've ever tried to find Allegria, it's really hard to find. Mm, that, <laughs> is so true. That, <laughs> that is true. I'll never forget that outing. But I went to Allegria, which is a Salvation Army shelter for homeless families who are affected by HIV and AIDS mm. here in Los Angeles. Um, and I was meeting with a woman named Jill and was going to tell her story. And it, Jill told me about her life and about the moment that she found out that she was HIV positive And in that same doctor's appointment, found out that she was also pregnant. Wow. And so the baby would be born uh, infected. And at the time, the baby was two and running all around the apartment as we were talking. And she showed me these four giant vials of uh, antiviral medication that she had to give the baby every day. And um, it, for her, that was a turning point that she became a mom and that uh, she had a new story to write that she needed to come up with a, a new plan for her own life. And so she was in the process of making all that happen at the time. And so we told her story and about um, her involvement with the Salvation Army and how she was turning things around. But this was some 13 years ago, but I've thought about her in the last year and just kind of wonder where she is and uh, how things have hap developed and happened in her life since then. And I hope and pray that she's doing well today. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, that was a really good story <laughs> to me. Um, but what what makes a good story? Yeah, so, uh, well... A lot of elements, but <laughs> I think the biggest thing is thinking about it in terms of not so much communicating information, but communicating feelings. If we go back to that, the science elements in it, which is the only science that I am willing to get on board with, but uh, getting into that, how we tap into somebody's ability to capture their attention and then motivate them along the way. Um, it's really about being able to communicate feelings. So a few points on this. One, you have to know who you're talking to. I'm sure this is a big point for youth culture, being able to talk to people in their words and their language. And that involves talking to them and asking them questions and about their frustrations, their fears, their joys, um, and using those words to mirror back to them in what you're talking about. Um, that can definitely help connect. Um, you want to use imagery instead of abstract concepts. Um, we talk a lot in the Salvation Army about those big issues, about equality and justice and fairness and wellness. And um, those are all important topics, but those don't necessarily translate into understandable uh, things that somebody can picture. Let um, me go back to MLK's speech. He talked in it about, I have a dream of little black boys and black girls holding hands with little white boys and white girls. I mean, he didn't say, I have a dream for equality. He gave you a very clear picture of what you could imagine and picture um which makes it feel more real and uh more concrete yeah so that's uh one thing so talking to people in their wording using imagery in your language um using positive emotions uh, a lot of times we try to connect with people 
and get them to empathize with us with the sad stories. Um, but if you've ever seen the Sarah McLaughlin commercial uh, with the, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Was it ASPCA yeah. or yeah. something? Yeah. yeah. You like immediately change the channel because we don't. I get, no, Alyssa, keep, there's a lot of triggers happening. Right now. Back to the dogs. Sorry. <laughs> But we don't want those sad emotions. People don't want to feel sad or guilty if there's not a way to resolve those mm. feelings. So in um, in a way to deal with that, we just avoid it. So we don't want to target somebody's negative emotions. We want to try to target the positive emotions. How, What's the outcome that we want and how can we get them to feel that pride or that awe um, and putting things in those terms instead of trying to create the sadness. So that's another one. Uh, we want a meaningful call to action in any story. Uh, again, back to that using concrete imagery. Um, if we take equality as an example, again, with some of the bus boycotts in the 1950s um, to end segregation of the bus system, the call to action wasn't to end segregation. It was don't ride the bus. That was the exact line that they used. So it was very tangible, very understandable, something that people can understand about how they can get involved, what exactly they can do. Um, so the meaningful call to action is huge. And then just telling better stories. So a story does have certain elements of it. It has a character. It has to have some sort of tension. Um, I'm sure that you've heard of the hero's journey, uh, Joseph, Joseph Campbell's Campbell. formula for a good story. And that's like Star the... Wars. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> There's so many uh, stories that fit directly into the hero's journey formula. Um, and so... That would be a good place to start. If you Google Hero's Journey, you can see the full breakdown. But having a character that goes out on an adventure, has a problem, meets a guide, and then ends up coming through that and hopefully and into a positive outcome. So Gets yeah. his arm cut off. Yeah. yeah. He knows that the guy's his father. <laughs> right, exactly. Sorry, spoilers. Guys, <laughs> spoilers. This is, this is insane. <laughs> Stop with the spoilers. <laughs> um, I'm curious, how can people get better at those elements or those, um, like we talked about what makes a good story. How What are maybe some simple ways that people can get better at stereo, st- stereotyping? That's not what I meant. <laughs> Storytelling in general. Yeah, I mean, it's I could important. I answer the stereotype question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I heard it said that people don't um, get involved not because they don't have enough information, but because they don't care or they don't know what to do. So I think we need to keep that in mind when we're telling stories. Um, how can we make people care? And some of those are through those elements that we talked about. Um, but then if you're actually writing a story and wanting to get better at it, um, well, I would point you first to Caring <laughs> Magazine. <laughs> uh, we actually have a free five-day email writing course, which is a oh, full wow. writing workshop that we turned into an email course um, all about uh, the fundamentals on story, some of the science behind it, what we look for in a good story, and then how to use – it walks you through exercises of your own values to find your story and some things that you can do to start putting that into actual words on paper or on video or however you choose to tell it. Um, But that would be a great place to start. There's other resources. Obviously, Roy Peter Clark's books are really good for beginning writers, like early writing tools and um, things that you can look to do as you're actually telling the story. Um, So I might say for somebody who's really at their starting point to Google the hero's journey, look at that formula and what, what that is and the elements of it. And start noticing that in all the stories that you're watching. If you're watching a movie, look for those different pieces. You're going to see them show up all over. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so as an editor-in-chief of Caring and also New Frontier Chronicle, has there ever been a, a story that has maybe had a wider impact than you expected? Maybe it um, reached audiences that you didn't necessarily intend for it to reach. Right. Well, I think one of the coolest parts about uh, my job is that it's different all the time, uh, always telling somebody else's story. Um, I've done stories here in Los Angeles and in Denver and in Hawaii and in Vietnam and India and Cuba and all these places that everybody, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, you have a story to tell. Um, so that's one of the things that I love most about uh, my job. And we hear a lot of times on the backside of that from people who somebody's story for whatever reason, connected with them specifically and 
uh, resonated. So it's really fun to hear some of those. I mean, that we've had people that have contacted us and wanted to give to a specific program because they loved that story or they wanted to get in touch with somebody that they read about. Um, so we hear a lot of those things. Um, but what I, I always like to just tell people, it doesn't really matter who you are, that everybody has a story. And uh, if we spend a little bit of time with you, we, we would love to tell it. It's awesome. So um, if I don't have any experience or I don't feel like I'm really good at writing stories, yeah. um, what, is, what is a way that I can get started? Like if I don't feel like I'm, you know, this is my area, but I want to do it. Right. How would I get started? So a few writing tips. Yes. All right. Well, if you're willing to let me word nerd out on you for, for a minute. It, yes. <laughs> yes. We're not afraid of nerds. Nope. <laughs> Put like a, a nerd like flash. <laughs> nerd, nerd, nerd. Here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I always tell people to try to write, uh, aim to be clear, concise, and correct. So nice little formula clear, for you there. Correct. Correct. Yep. Three C's. Three C's. Three C's. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Abraham and I learned the same way clearly. Yes. <laughs> Clear, concise, correct. Yes. Uh, and I jotted a few notes so I make sure I remember all the pieces of uh, this. But when you're talking about clarity, without it, you lose every time. So that's our number one goal is to be clear. And there's a few things that we can do to be more clear. We talked about understanding your audience, tailoring your words accordingly, mirroring things that they say. Um, you want to always speak to one person when you're writing. Uh, we forget sometimes that when we're on our computer or reading something, that's an individual activity. We're not sitting around a campfire on our computers. So we have to write in that same way that we're writing to one person. And so actually using the words you, your, and the other your, uh, they can help connect a lot better with people than if you were to say everyone or you guys, and you immediately lose people when you start talking with that. Um, you want to, again, use the details, use imagery, um, anything that's vague or abstract comes across as generic or mediocre. So we want to be really specific, um, really detailed. And if you're not sure about this, a good way to think about it is could your writing be handed over to a director and filmed? Like, is there enough detail there that they know what it should look like uh, just from the words that you use? Um, if not, then you need to go back and add more detail. Uh, it's best to just avoid cliches and cleverness. Uh Pretty much every time you just lose people when you're trying to add those into your writing. So it's best just to like steer an clear. What's an example? Oh, any cliche you can think of. <laughs> like uh, a cliche saying in, in when you're trying to describe something? like or Yeah. Uh, what if, to what if you're trying example. to like use a cliche to, uh, I'm just going like. The if, apple doesn't fall from the tree. Right. right. If you're trying to use it as, as a tool to, to paint the picture, you know. Yeah, or I've seen, and I don't know why this is not a Salvation Army example, but I've seen on websites or somebody says, like, give us your clams instead of, like, purchase now. Like, yeah. we oh, don't, like, uh, nobody knows what that means. Yeah, like, yeah, you're trying yeah. to be you clever. The clams yes. go with their, like, product, but it just is confusing yeah. and yeah. weird and okay. kind of throws you off. So instead of trying to be cute and clever like that, it's best to be clear. Be clear. Say <laughs> yeah. what you got to say. Right. Okay. You can be clever in person. Yeah, all you yeah, want. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then always start with the benefit and the desired outcome. You want to make sure, first of all, that you know that, and then that can help you to create those uh, meaningful call to actions within your writing as well. So mm. have to know the outcome and make that very clear at the start of your writing. Next up would be concise. So we're being clear. We also want to be concise. Mm. In general, people use way too many words. Uh, so I always like to tell people to take what you've written mm -hmm. and figure out what the word count is and then go back and take a third of them out. Just cut a third of the words. You're going to have a better piece of writing mm -hmm. right there because um, we just use too many words. Um, so some of that is filler words. A lot of the like reallys and quiet and I words like college that. college for that, by the I way. I was going to say, that's like high yeah. word counts on papers. Yeah. Oh, 400 words. All that you're, filler. Like, just rambling. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. that's the Increase the font. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Double the space. Yeah. Yeah. Feel, All the I tricks think, of the trade there, huh? I think I feel that when I write, or, or I feel that pressure from high school to, to write, because it's got to be long, and if it's yeah. not long, you don't look smart. No, yep. That's true. Right. I yeah. think you're yeah. conditioned to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is actually the opposite of yeah. <laughs> what we're wanting to do. So yeah. we I'm, don't want all those filler words. I'm going to go tell my words. parents I did it wrong all those years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They'll say, you didn't do it anyways. <laughs> 
Uh, another way to be concise is to use descriptors uh-huh. like butter. Very sparingly spread your adjectives and your adverbs. Um, too many of them, you start to just get too much. So mm. want to use those sparingly and then use the objective ones, things like purple or frozen, um, the objective, factual descriptors rather than things like beautiful and amazing. We see mm. a lot of that in stuff that's submitted our way um, or that it was a blessed experience or it was an amazing event. Like, well, what made it amazing? Like, Seem- I don't know. Hashtag blessed. It yeah. seems like you <laughs> yes. want to get rid of all the subjective exactly. things yep. and get more like... Use the objective verbs and adverbs and, uh, sorry, objective adjectives and adverbs so that we're seeing the descriptions. Again, can you see it? Can you picture it? I don't know what amazing looks like. It's different for everybody. So is it objective? Um, Then verbs, of course. Verbs are how we signify action in writing, and that's what moves people along uh, as we're reading something. So we want to use verbs, and not all verbs are created equal. So we want to, uh, this is the word nerd part I told Dude, you. Dude, I am learning a lot. Uh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Same. I'll tell you what a verb is later. <laughs> uh, so the ones that I like to avoid, which I actually had a class in college that we weren't allowed to use any form of the verb to be. So am, is, are, was, were, being, been. You could not have that in writing anywhere, which is really difficult because you wow. realize how often you use those verbs. Um, but those are what we would consider boring verbs. So you want to look for things that have uh, verbs with verve, let's say. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Sounds like a band name. <laughs> yeah, could be. Verbs with verve. Verb. <laughs> yep. So absorb, amplify, bash, capture. I mean, verbs that have more uh, more oomph to them than... Zing. Exactly. Right. <laughs> than saying the man was walking up the mountain. That's... That's boring, right? I mean, maybe the man lurched up the mountain or figure out a way to say it that's a little bit more more interesting. Um, and then along with that, always aim to use active voice rather than passive voice. So an active voice, we know that the person is doing the action. So Kristen picked up the phone would be an active voice sentence rather than the phone was picked up by Kristen, which is the passive hmm side of that and again that verb was is in there those the to be verbs are red flags for passive voice generally Uh, so my tip is to always use active voice as much as possible passive voice isn't grammatically incorrect but it causes a lot more words and just isn't as strong uh, of writing and then finally uh, just like everybody wants the corner office the best real estate in the the office you want to keep in mind that the start of your sentences, the start of your paragraphs, those are like the corner offices. Those are the most important real estate in your writing. So you want to keep whatever's most important, whatever that desired outcome is at the start. Uh, because if you don't, you lose people. Um, they might not get into it down the, the road. Um, so sometimes we'll see things like, I firmly believe deep in my heart that everyone deserves a comfortable bed or whatever it is. Well, you can just eliminate that entire first part and just say everyone deserves a comfortable bed. It says the same thing, uses less words, and you don't lose people uh, as you're giving a bunch of fluff in there. So I'm guilty of that one a lot. I'm sorry. Just being transparent. <laughs> I felt like I needed to share that. I'm, I'm very guilty of that. Yeah. Um, for any of these things, if you're not sure if they show up in your writing, there's an online tool called the Hemingway app. If you Google that, you'll see it. You can copy and paste your text directly onto the page, and it'll show you all of these things in your own writing and give you suggestions for helping to correct them. Um, so that's nice. clear, concise, and then finally correct. Obviously, uh, we want to make sure what we're writing is correct. Exactly. Yeah. As they say in journalism school, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Yeah. Don't assume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so man, that's kind of depressing. I checking know. names, checking uh, Mom. names of people, names of places, the spellings, all of those things. You have to make sure that whether you're writing an email or you're writing an article, I mean, d- obviously double checking your facts and then just reading through it. Yeah. Again, whether it's an email or something, it you'll see a big difference if you just take a second to read back through it a final time before you hit send. So clear, concise, and correct. That's awesome. Well, awesome. Everyone has a story to tell. Um, capture it. Yeah. Share it. Yeah. Write it. If you have a story and you want to share in uh, any of the publications, mm-hmm. how, how do they do that? 
Like if they want to share in your publications and write something, how do they contact you and all that? Definitely. Uh, well, you can contact me directly um, through Outlook or hop onto either one of our publications, newfrontierchronicle.org or caringmagazine.org, and you'll find uh, ways to contact us there. You'll find the Find Your Story um, email course on the Caring site. That'd be a great place to start. We have a Share Your Story function on Caring where we're trying to get people's stories and um you might hear from us for a feature we might share it directly from what you've written but we're trying to share more stories um, through people's submissions that way too so thank you kristen uh i learned a lot that was very helpful uh don't forget to subscribe to uh the podcast um they have a podcast kristen has a podcast the do-gooder podcast we'll put that in the show notes subscribe to that as well uh, and subscribe to anything that we have to do because it makes us happy. <laughs> and it's what we need. And hopefully it's helpful. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, I'll we hope back. so. It's, it's, I think it's helpful. Uh, thank you again. Uh, yeah. We're good. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Thank All you. right. Thanks, Kristen.